Sure, thanks so much, Brian. Uh, thanks to Professor Wiley for, for asking me to be here and uh, for the other panelists on our, on our panel. Um, so this is uh, Ina Cole survey, an inquiry into OER projects, uh, practices, and policy in US K-12 schools. Uh, my name is Timothy Vollmer, and I'm a policy fellow with Creative Commons this year in Washington, DC. And we've been working with various organizations working to support OER. Uh, including kind of general education about open educational resources uh, and Creative Commons, of course, uh, for federal and state policymakers, for teachers, and for other groups. Uh, the group that conducted this brief inquiry that we're going to talk about is INACOL, and that stands for the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. And INACOL is a nonprofit membership association based in Washington, D.C., uh, and it has uh, 3,100 members. Uh, these include K-12 school districts, uh, charter schools, state education agencies, uh, nonprofits, research institutions, and also some corporate entities um, and technology providers. And Ina Cole and its executive director, Susan Patrick, uh, have been key contributors to the OER work, the policy work that's been going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, they unfortunately couldn't be here today. They have one of their uh, yearly meetings coming up in, a, in about a week uh, in Arizona. So I'm going to be here talking a little bit about the, uh, this survey that they did. So I'd like to give an overview of what we'd like to discuss over the next few minutes. First, I can discuss, discuss the goals of the Ina Cole survey. Um, then we'll look at some of the trends, policies, and challenges that were heard from the respondents. Uh, in regard to their knowledge of and involvement in uh, OER. And after we do this, it'd be fantastic to hear from you, uh, especially uh, kind of from around the world, the perspective of, of, of policy frameworks and educational best practices um, around OER uh, within K-12. So the audience for the survey were state virtual schools, uh, districts, and higher education institutions that provide online courses. And the, the purpose of the survey sorry, uh, was to identify how OER are used in online and blended learning environments. Um, and they did this by addressing kind of two overarching questions. Uh, the first, how is OER being used in K-12 online education? And the second, uh, what are some existing OER models at the state, district, or individual school level? And we all know there's varying definitions of what OER actually means. Uh, Ina Cole said that OER are openly licensed materials that permit educators to share, access, and collaborate so they can customize and personalize content and instruction. So the survey was sent out to uh, Ina Cole's institutional members. And these are folks involved in administering, teaching, or working in a program that offers online courses. Uh, thus, this group were identified as those most likely to be using OER. So the survey is not uh, set up to determine OER penetration across all types of schools or grade levels, uh, but simply to identify projects and policies in place and try to determine uh, how they can be extended if those are indeed effective. Uh, so in that way, it's not a scientific, scientific survey. Uh, nearly all the respondents had at least some knowledge about of, of open educational resources, and obviously we'd expect a much lower knowledge of OER uh, from a random sample. So some of the responses were interesting, and uh, we gathered them into the following categories. Um, first off, kind of, what do you know about open educational resources and what sorts of projects and organizations uh, does your group collaborate with? Uh, what sorts of professional development programs and resources are here to educate uh, teachers about OER? How is OER funded and how can it be sustainable? Always a hot topic. Uh, and also, uh, what policies and models uh, for OER are in place or being constructed right now? And then finally, uh, looking into the future, uh, where should we place our focus in OER uh, within K-12 education? So in K-12 online schools, there was a high level of general familiarity with OER and a moderate level of direct involvement in OER projects. 94% uh, of the respondents had heard about OER. 
and 40% work directly on OER initiatives at their schools. And about a third don't work directly on OER, but knew about OER projects uh, going on in other schools. And the most popular uses uh, of OER in the schools included uh, for distance or online learning, uh, for curriculum development, uh, and uh, for using OER in blended learning environments. And when asked to identify some of the major partners uh, from a short list uh, that I, Nicole, provided, uh, many said MITEI, which is the Monterey Institute for Technology and Education. Uh, that's a popular uh, nonprofit in the U.S. that develops and distributes OER content and courses. Uh, CK12, a nonprofit open textbook publisher. Uh, Connections, which is a platform for OER for K-12, and they have over 17,000 openly licensed uh, education teaching modules. Uh, also other groups like Moodle, uh, Thinkfinity, Merlot, iTunes U, Edutopia, and a bunch of others. Uh, one interesting point was though uh, the fact that uh, almost half said they don't have any partnerships or other relationships with organizations working to develop or provide OER. Uh, when we look at professional development for OER, uh, the types and scope uh, vary, vary widely. Uh, some noted that there are projects to inform teachers about open educational resources, but these are not necessarily OER specific, and uh, they teach general kind of technical skills or things like working in the online environment. So perhaps training in how to implement and use OER could be meshed together uh, with some of these other types of professional development that are going on. Uh, an interesting yet unsurprising point uh, was the ongoing confusion uh, between the difference of educational content that is simply online and content that is released under an open license. Um, while teachers uh, wanted to know more about OER generally, uh, there's little formal training for professional development uh, just because there's no funding to do it. Uh, some respondents said that word of mouth was one of the biggest ways that they heard about OER. Uh, some teachers were able to take part in limited webinars, kind of online classes, uh, also large group training programs uh, offered either by their school or by another school. Uh, some offered one-on-one uh, -on -one help, actually, for things like uh, curriculum development and even in addressing copyright considerations in OER. I found that to be pretty interesting. Um, some used development resources by other groups that they worked with, uh, like MITEI's National Repository of Online Courses. Um, some groups mentioned they have actually an online training handbook that outlines ways to find and incorporate OER into their classes. Um, so obviously things like that are the exception uh, and not the rule right now, but these sorts of materials uh, and public domain resources could and should be shared as OER so that others can learn about them too. Uh, so we kind of move into how the OER projects are funded. Uh, about 20% of the respondents said they get some money from federal funds or are planning to do it. Uh, some noted some inroads at exploring funding models uh, through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, especially through the Investing in Innovation Fund. Uh, that's through uh, the Department of Ed. 33% uh, got some funds from the state, 23% uh, got some funds from their local districts, 5% got some funding from foundations, which has historically been a, been a large piece of this. Uh, and then there's also other funding sources, which range from kind of social entrepreneurship, marketing revenue, and even uh, enrollment fee income. So just as we saw with the uh, professional development resources, that the financial support really spans a really broad spectrum. And sustainability is always on the mind of, of the respondents. Uh, as we all know, there's an expectation that after the grant money runs out, uh, the initiative should, should continue. Uh, we found that the knowledge about funding and sustainability mechanisms is really less than ideal at this point, and that there needs to be better awareness of these programs and uh, more organizational capacity to partner with other groups uh, when the time comes to apply for some of this funding. 
And we also need to continue to insist that OER be championed at the policy level. Uh, one thing the U.S. Department of Education is thinking about making OER a priority in their discretionary grant programs. Some other respondents noted that uh, there is an ongoing discussion uh, to be able to share OER materials between states, and such a sharing would, would enable cost savings um, because each state wouldn't have to recreate the wheel in making their own resources. They can actually share between states, which they can't really do now. Uh, and some states are looking to do this through uh, adopting the state common core standards uh, for English arts and math in the U.S. Uh, as OER is still a relatively new topic, uh, the survey found that there are few formal policies in place for OER in K-12. to uh, About half the respondents uh, said there were none. 7% uh, said they have a state or district policy about OER. And 35% uh, just didn't know. Um, a few of the respondents knew about pilots or models in the state for using OER as instructional materials, but across the board it really wasn't that much. Uh, we, we do see interesting uh, models, though, like the Open High School of Utah, uh, which in their charter says that they use uh, uh, open content exclusively. Um, some respondents noted that they plan to include uh, OER into their state's educational technology plan uh, in the future, uh, but we know that this may require significant uh, outreach and guidance. Um, and all others noted that their schools are looking towards groups like Mighty, uh, as a model for, for OER adoption. So the survey generated some interesting responses about which types of OER would be most useful in supporting K-12 education. Uh, and the following numbers kind of add up to greater than 100% because uh, respondents could choose more than one answer. But 90% said uh, they wanted to see OER for supplementary online uh, learning materials. About 70% said for digital textbooks. Uh, and uh, textbooks to replace hard copy text. 70% um, said uh, using it for building open online courses. 60% said using OER uh, as a component in building better assessment mechanisms. And some wanted to see OER, uh, an OER kind of open learning object repository built uh, for, for their use. Uh, so quick, just quickly, some other kind of uses that were suggested were uh, learning materials for struggling students that can kind of go back and review things uh, for credit recovery, for independent study, uh, for college prep, uh, special education, library tutorials, uh, and also just provide opportunities for their students to engage with content that's not developed and used uh, uh, at the school itself. And there was a, a general impetus for supporting OER that is rich content, rich multimedia things like video, audio, interactive materials. Um, and also, uh, just kind of finishing up, some others said they should focus on affordability when talking about OER and alignment with state standards. Uh, I met, briefly mentioned the, the state common core standards. So I think my time's up about now. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, as we kind of move into the discussion now and later, um, it'd be great to kind of hear of other sorts of policy frameworks that are happening kind of around the world, uh, both in kind of best practices in, in providing education and other sorts of models. So thanks so much.